I don't think that there's any reason why we can't be a $100 billion company. If we continue to grow at this rate, members are expected to it's climb possible. even faster and we're able to price loans efficiently, which we have been since what, 2011 or whatever. Like we've been a, a major player in it being able to price loans that don't default. I don't see that changing. On the opposite side, it's like, okay, well then other fintechs can come in and be cool for a little bit and, and take market share that way. But a lot of those new fintechs are going to have to sign up with Galileo. So sure, Chime has a lot of customers. Sure, Robinhood has a lot of customers. Have you ever spent out of Robinhood? Because if you did, you spent through Galileo. Well, that's the flywheel. If Galileo gets more people, it gets smarter. And all of a sudden, you can't go anywhere else. I mean, that, that's the major bull case. That's the $100 billion bank right there. I'm a big believer. I'm a big, but that, big that has believer. to happen. That's still, you know, that, that has to happen. That's, this is a long time away couple of exciting things. Some people actually started to get rolled out their SoFi UI updates. It does look at like exactly what we saw in January. From the people that have had hands-on access, because it is starting to be rolled out, that it is quite useful. It's a massive improvement to where we were before. Nothing's been happening for four and a half years. And if you look at the bottom right, Moto finally announces a new UI update for Invest. However, the overall app experience is not going to happen anytime soon. So uh, basically, Noto replied to Riley and he said, we are working on a new Invest app very shortly. And then he said, we will oh, also be looking at the user experience for the entire <laughs> application like end to end, but there's been no hands on keyboards yet. This is still in its exploration phase. They're just going to build it on technicists. That's exactly right. Because right. like I said before, SoFi's back end is split into four different pieces. He's working on getting all these pieces under our belt. We're starting to pull in credit cards. We have checking and savings under our belt, but in the investment side is not under our belt yet. We don't have our own technology for doing investing. I made a video earlier today. We know that enhanced option trading is going to come in Q3. And now that we got the enhanced SoFi Invest app, it's going to be really interesting to see if we do become something that is closer in comparison to Robinhood and even an enticing force siphoning users off of Robinhood's platform onto SoFi because of the coincidental timing of both of these changes happening in the same quarter. Even if you offer level one, it doesn't quite have the, the cool feeling or... And I guess it's a question for Riley as to like what he defines as cool, but does this app update now increase SoFi's cool factor? Where would you place that? Yeah, it's a step in the right direction. This just makes it a lot more sticky. Like right now, if you take out margin, in, in SoFi Invest. In this new update, it's way more intuitive. It's easier to navigate through the app. And the reason why I'm so bearish on Robinhood is that like there is literally only so many financial products that you can make. Sure, you can do 24 hour, five day a week trading, and then maybe they'll open it up to 24 hours, seven day a week trading. And then eventually like you can't make it any better than that. The other fintechs will catch up. Yes, there is some ease of use there, but I just don't see how past a UI like a UI doesn't make a, a business. It, it Sure, it makes a, a product, but it doesn't make a business. What I think is so good about SoFi is like, okay, once we get out level one options, then we'll be that much closer. Will they be as intuitive as Robinhood's? No. Will your mortgage rate be affected by you having your invest platform on SoFi? Maybe. There is benefits to having your money on platforms if they can use those as collateral, for example. And Anthony Noto shared a Cornerstone Advisors article talking about SoFi's growth. This was the article, the checking account war is over and the fintechs have won. They shared a lot of great details in terms of the percentages of new checking accounts opened and the type of institutions. As you can tell, all the other actually shrunk in their percentage of new account opens where digital bank and fintechs have continued to climb year after year. It's obviously showing people are gaining a larger appetite for this type of product. You can see the demographic of the people that are actually considering digital banks or fintechs, their primary checking account provider is growing across all demographics, including the baby boomers going from 4% to 11% which is a massive spike, but I think that's 175% increase or something. Gen X, millennials, Gen Zs, all seeing even larger increases than that. Yeah, but this was um, also, there's macro repercussions that result in this, right? Like everybody is going to go up when you have a lockdown for three years and people can't go to branches. Of course, they're going to go to digital banks. This is comparing 2020 to 2023. 90% of that time, oh, wow. people were locked.
locked up. So regional banks are still getting 21% new account opens. That's kind of crazy to me. Yeah, of the percentage of new checking accounts, 21% of them go to regional banks. <laughs> it's still kind of crazy to me that people actually walk into a regional bank. They also have online digital accounts as well. Like th that's the one thing that I also realized oh, is that's like true. it was something like 75% of people still do all of their banking online, but still the high majority, 81% are doing it through their mega banks. So they're just using mm -hmm. a fintech platform through a mega bank brand. And to negate your point, Tevis, <laughs> you would see a larger spike in the percentage of new checking accounts if you saw it. The higher percentage is it's not front loaded. It seems to be increasing every single year. So the highest majority of new digital banks is coming in still in 2023. Obviously, there's going to be tailwinds because fintechs have lower barriers to entry. You can just download an app and do a 10 minute sign up process. Whereas for the physical brick and mortar places, you actually have to go there physically. There's hurdles that are put in place, right? And so it makes sense that the percentage would increase every subsequent year. Yeah, I, I don't think you're giving the fintechs nearly enough credit. I think 2020 was probably, I'm sure there was a large increase whenever people had to make a direct switch. You see that in PayPal's numbers or any of the fintechs. But even in 2020, the regional banks and mega banks still made up a larger percentage of the total checking accounts than did fintechs this year. Like, I don't think this is a, a macro trend. This seems to just be like, it doesn't seem secu secular at all. It seems like this is just going forward. People are liking this product across the board. I'm bullish on fintech just as much as the next person is. I'm just saying that I just don't know how clean the data is from just that fintech lens alone. Sure. Riley was literally on a pod four weeks ago and he got the Apple card while in the pod. If you're comparing one to one, that is the benefit to fintech. That's why people are investing. SoFi was named very specifically in this article. Winners and losers, SoFi and Wells Fargo. In the first <laughs> half of 2023, SoFi's market share quadrupled to 4%, a Wells Fargo share dropped by more than half to 3.5%. SoFi, as a percentage, is growing and that's not going to plan to slow down. They continue to push out way more products comparatively to the Wells Fargo's. It's getting people through the door and then they stay. It's also pretty cool, at least for me to see that 4% of new accounts opened are SoFi, a company with 5 million members in a country of 330 million people. Why what first you... led you to invest? Wait, you're in? <laughs> I thought you were out, Fatelli. What happened was I invested in SoFi when it almost spacked, and then I lost some money on it. I forgot exactly what, and then I was out. I didn't get rid of my Square, though. I didn't get rid of my PayPal, so I'm still bag holding a lot of that. But yeah, I sold out of SoFi. FinTech is like, it's difficult, man. It's like, what is the moat of FinTech? And maybe you guys can answer this question, but I go back and forth, and I've done a lot of due diligence. I bought SoFi because look, it fell down to five bucks. It became almost a no-brainer that at five dollars that there was going to be some sort of bounce. I decided to just do leaps. So I bought a bunch of leaps and I bought a couple of shares too at five dollars because I was like, okay, at five bucks, I don't believe SoFi is going to zero. I believe that it's going to have some sort of a future and something's going to happen. But once again, I go back to what is the moat of fintechs? Because at the end of the day, the way SoFi is getting their customers right now is because the rates are high. They're getting a lot yeah. of customers right now because they're advertising advertising, they're spending a lot of money. That's working out right now, but two years from now, as soon as the rates start coming down, two years, three years, whatever, hopefully they've hit escape velocity. And at that point they are, uh, Noto's bag needs to be what, 25 bucks? My options have printed, I've made a lot of money. And I don't think I'll be the guy holding it past $25. So once that happens, I think I'm out because once again, I go back to what is the mode of fintech? Unless SoFi proves that Galileo is not a fly-by-night thing and they can actually create a SaaS business out of it, which was the original reason I invested in SoFi because I loved yeah. what they were doing with Galileo. I thought this is brilliant. I don't know of many fintechs doing this type of a thing. Even Square is not even doing something like this, right? And I said, look, if uh -huh. SoFi gets anywhere near Wells Fargo, we're talking about what, $150 billion company, anywhere near it. So the thesis is, once again, Galileo, 25 billion seems very reasonable if it's successful. I'm not investing it for the bank. If SoFi has a real moat in terms of tech, what do you think about that? Look, the Galileo thesis is going to take a while to play out. One of the main reasons I'm investing in SoFi is that flywheel, them having an ecosystem with SoFi Plus as the central spoke to that ecosystem. And through SoFi Plus, they can diversify your awards to such an extent that they can double dip, triple dip, quadruple dip you in so many different products in their ecosystem and increase that stickiness 
per user. That's not a technical moat, first of all, which you just mentioned. That's a, something easily copyable by anybody. If they do, I'm not saying old the old guard, Wells Fargo, and everybody's going to do it properly. What is the actual moat of a, of a company like, besides the <clears throat> stickiness of the multiple products? We know they have that. The way that I think about it is who can compete? If it's a race to the highest APYs, SoFi versus a lot of the fintech companies has that ability to raise their APYs because they're making money through their lending section. So they have all this money that they can offer through their bank charter because they're lowering their cost of funding that the normal fintechs can't necessarily afford to be as profitable because they have to pay those fees to another bank. And then you look at the Wells Fargo, okay, well, how can they compete? Well, they've got all these branches, large pension funds, massive amounts of high expenses like dividends for their stock. I don't believe that they can compete either because they have all of these obligations already. So, so you're, you're talking about legacy infrastructure. They're stuck sort of. Okay, fine. So let's discount all the, the old guard, the JPMs or whatever. Who are the new guys who are competing with? Because I actually don't know. Who are the new guys competing with SoFi? <laughs> well, so let's take it one thing at a time. Let's just all agree on the positioning where SoFi is in the market as a hybrid player, right? Like if you think of a spectrum, on one end of the spectrum, you have the, the brick and mortars, the Wells Fargo's, the JP Morgan's. On the other end of the spectrum, you have like the cash apps, the, you know, the, the fully fintech like mobile apps you can download. And then SoFi is somewhere in the middle. So you could make a case that SoFi is a direct competitor with the brick and mortars. You could also make a case that they are a direct competitor with like Cash App, let's say. But the truth is that by being hybrid player in the middle, you get the best of both worlds. You get lower fees because you don't have the legacy infrastructure and you get that ecosystem, which a lot of these uh, modern fintechs can't provide because SoFi is also a chartered bank. That, that is very powerful, by the way. The stock should be over 10 bucks just because it's a bank now. It's an official bank, but it's not. So the question is, is Robinhood, is Square, like all of these other players, are they actually, are they working towards that too? Which I don't even, once again, I'm not following all of this fintechs very closely. So are they working towards the same thing, becoming chartered banks? And basically SoFi is going to end up competing with Square and Square has more money. So Square might win this whole game too, right? If they actually go that route. Square's going the route of or PayPal and, and, and Venmo similarly. They, they're looking for international so expansion and the, and the nut that they've cracked is some of the lowest customer acquisition costs. That's what's so great about Robinhood, Cash App, and Nubank, for example, is they've cracked the customer acquisition cost model, where SoFi is a completely different beast. They're not going after low customer acquisition costs. They're willing to pay for it because we're a lending first company, right? We're, we're trying to get people through the door at whatever price it is, as long as you know, we have some sort of break even that's close to whenever we acquired the customer. So there are different approaches, but they're, they're not going after a national bank license because it's very hard to go international after that. In that case, I would say then if that doesn't happen, I would say SoFi does have a moat, like you said, in, in between all of these players, because if they can't get the banking charter like that SoFi got, then you do have, I'm going to call it a moat, but it's still hard for me to say that because like I've seen just FinTech totally get destroyed because once again, at the end of the day, even PayPal right now, why are people not respecting it? In fact, I've invested a little bit more money into PayPal because it's undervalued. The reason they're being undervalued, the same as SoFi, is like at the end of the day, they're thinking somebody can come along and do what they're doing. All these players are coming in. It's such low barrier to entry for all of this. So if I got the bank charting, they got Galileo. So if I was to say there was a moat, it would be those two things that those other players don't seem to have. Yeah. Okay, Q1 2023. I'm sure you guys know it better than I do. Are you worried about that the members are slowing down because they were growing really no. fast for a couple of quarters? No? Well, I'll, I'll let I'll let Tevis speak on it. Sequentially, Vitaly, this was a number that is concerning at, at face value, but then management talks about it. The members that they're acquiring are pretty directly attributable to marketing spend, which has come down in this market. And it's going to go back up when the rates come down. And then number two is that um, SoFi can actually throttle a lot of the members that they accept with their FICO scores to say, okay, if the market is bad, if we're looking like we're going to head into a recession, we only want to accept 750s and above because we want to lower that delinquency rate as much as possible. We want to have the best, the best clients, but in times where the market is on the up, they can lower that FICO score rating and they can get more members to the door. And so they're basically anchoring their member growth to around 400 to 450,000 each quarter. When you say anchoring, you're saying they're actually stopping member growth? They're stopping sales and marketing expense. They're so not they're, actively they're not promoting it. 
Okay, so yeah. that makes sense because they do have large expenses for promoting their product in order to get more people in the door. So they have to spend a lot of money to get people. And obviously other fintechs can do the same thing, spend a lot of money to get people. That That's not a, a virtuous cycle. A virtuous cycle is like, I drive my Tesla. My next door neighbor is like, hey, I want that thing. And then they get it. And then the next door guy sees it. I don't go home and talk about SoFi to anybody. If you're in this ecosystem. I get SoFi is monetizing you, but you have no desire to really go to your friends and be like, hey guys, join this unless you're like a SoFi bull and you have SoFi Weekly. There's referral fees and stuff like this where, you know, you can talk to your friends and they'll give each of you $25 to sign each other up. And there, there is a little bit of that. And they were saying for quite a while that referrals were at the highest that they've ever seen. But now I think that there's such a focus, as you can tell, there's this 400,000 plus member barrier right now which they've said is just, that's the limiting factor because they are trying to hit profitability, net income gap profitability. For, in 2024, they're saying that their new members will ramp up to 800 to 1 million new customers per quarter. Now, like you said- Is that what they're spend increasing? They've mentioned that too? Potentially, but also there is that network effect. Like yeah, you might so not scroll, think that people talk about their banks, but they do. The dark blue is their lending products. The light blue is their financial services products. And ever since 2021, they've been introduced producing more and more financial services products. Lending is just home, student, and personal loans. But uh, financial services like SoFi Invest, SoFi Money, SoFi Relay, which is their fastest growing product. The cool thing about this is that that flywheel is increasing. So if you think about it, you have on one hand, the network effects around like me sharing SoFi and promoting it with my friends and family. But on the other hand, you have this deep desire with people that want to centralize a lot of their financial information, want to have it all live in one place and it be a seamless user experience for them. I want to have all of my main apps in one. I want to have a seamless transition between my bank account and my investing app. I don't want to have any friction points there. It's similar to like insurance, for example, like you get this bundling effect with all these different streams. And then overall, you get a, just a more cohesive user experience that's probably cheaper at the end of the day for you to use, right? As a result of this, that flywheel has gone up drastically over the last couple of years. And that's also one of the reasons why they can get to 800,000. Of course, they're going to crank more sales and marketing spend to get there, but it's also about training that user behavior, especially as every subsequent year, they introduce more and more and more financial services products. Okay, so it's nice. I'm going to just counter with a couple of things. <clears throat> now, I'm a mini bull, but uh, I do see issues. One is uh, the flywheel. It's only within yourself, basically, because you're you're using the extra products. That's how they're monetizing you too. That's cool. I actually, I actually like that. The fact that I can get a loan and I can have a bank account and I can do investing, that sounds great. But let me just give the other side in terms of some of these things. Yep. As you get a little bit older, and you get a little bit more money and you don't want to put it in one little banking app in one place. Even if something happens and the FDIC or the SDIC covers it, you still want it sort of spread around where you have access to it. Some A site goes down, by the way. Okay, I've had sites go down where I can't trade or I can't access my money, but I have it somewhere else and I can access it. That's just one reason. So it's not good to have sure. it. I mean, by the way, banking relationships, having actual human beings that you can get loans. I'm in real estate. I buy property. So I have to talk to bankers all the time. And it's harder to talk to a SoFi banker. I don't think people nearly value the one-stop shop because Anthony knows been saying this. He goes, it's been five years since people have been saying, oh, well, anyone can come out with a full one-stop shop, but no one, no one is doing it. Why not? It must be quite hard. If that's the moat, then this one-stop shop, sure. I don't, I don't think that's the moat because it, maybe I'm too old. It just doesn't matter to me that they do everything. It doesn't. Uh, I'm using so, their products, by the way. I have an account, obviously look, room for improvement. And I think SoFi is doing a fantastic job. I think it's going to be a good business and it could be a great business. I'm not saying that. Forget about Galileo for a second. If they didn't have that, what is their moat? The fact that they have five apps in one? How ahead. many digital nationally chartered banks are there? They, I, this I is good. So, I, so you're actually right about that. So the chartered bank, the fact that they're a digital bank does help, but it's not enough for a regular consumer to say, oh, let me switch to SoFi. That, that's they don't care about that. I'm just saying, what do they care about at the end of the day? People are switching though. That's because of the high cost of them paying for people to switch right now. So as soon as they cut off the money printer in terms of trying to get uh, advertising, you see the, the amount of people joining drops. What happens if they don't advertise yes. anymore? It'll just go away. That is not a good business. This is the banking business model through and through. No one just simply wants to go to Wells Fargo or JP Morgan Chase or anything because their bank said it. It's usually because a single promotion that had caught their attention or something along these lines. The great thing about banking is that once you're there, it's not like a DraftKings or a HIM or something like this where you have to continuously give them money to stay. You set up direct deposit and that client is there well, for you. Once you're in, it's hard to get out. I agree with you there. Yeah.
I totally yeah. agree with you. So, so the cust- the high customer acquisition cost is fine. Right now, they have about uh, something like an 18 to 24 month period where they actually earn back that marketing spend for that user, right? The lifetime value is longer you know, than that. What's the actual cost per user? Fire is about $350 per person. That is a yeah, lot. Which is, person. yeah, but it's, so it's, it's not nearly as low as the cash apps and the new banks and these sorts of people. Wasn't squares like 20 bucks? Like $10. Yeah. But, but the thing is, is that they're not a lending company. Yeah. So their average revenue per user is extremely low. Right. And so you're, you're dealing with that's valid uh, mass, mass clientele, small margins. Why can't I, they I get the meant- calls down to 20, 30 bucks or whatever? Fifty. They don't want to be. The, they don't want to be that client. They don't want to be the every every person client. You're talking about a okay. A I very see high end. They're aiming for the seven hundred plus credit score. The guy who can afford. I see what you're saying. Okay. They're, gotcha. they're, th- that's why they're advertising with Amex. That's why they're advertising with SiriusXM. They're going after a more affluent client base through and through. <laughs> right. Right now, but like in the future, it doesn't matter. Once they build this infrastructure out, they're going to be able to make profitable products on top of it that they can siphon data from. If I get a loan at Wells Fargo, they're not going to know any information about me whenever I go to apply for a banking account. And it's hard to do that because all the tech stack is siloed. There's no way for these big banks to be able to compete in the future whenever SoFi has just this one platform where they can share all this data and the FICO score kind of like becomes useless because SoFi can derive insights that other companies can't because we offer so much just straight from your one app, you know? And I I do think that just like to build on Riley's point, I do think that that one-stop shop, like while we may argue whether it is or is not a moat, when you're playing in an entire industry that's a margins business, having that vertical integration, like it's one of the reasons why I invested in Tesla and I understand it's very different, but for Tesla to just sell their cars online and not go to dealers and not give a cut, you know, for them to uh, have that unified sort of assembly process, so on and so forth, it allowed them to play a much more aggressive game in terms of margins. They could mm-hmm. sell their cars at cheaper and outprice everybody else in the market. So for SoFi to now be a perfect hybrid of the pure fintechs and the pure legacies, they don't have all of that brick and mortar costs, but they also offer way more than than the fintechs because of their bank license. And then you add the layer of Galileo on top of that, it allows them the margin flexibility to be very enticing when you're talking about referrals, when you're talking about kickbacks, when you're talking about all of these people that they bring into their ecosystem. So they can be both very selective with the high quality borrowers that they're bringing in, but they can also be very generous with that same cohort of people because they know that they're always going to earn it back in, in a year or two years because of the lifetime value of that user, especially ROI that they're going to get over that lifetime value of the user is going to continuously go up and up and up because they're continuously launching more products, right? Someone who's a higher earner, but is not actually wealthy, does not have a Fidelity account, does not have a Schwab account, because like there is no way in hell I am switching those accounts where I have personal person I can talk to, easier to deal with my money, more services. But you're saying that it's going after millennials, exennials, going after people who are higher earners, but not there yet. So that makes sense. It actually does. Those people might want want to start somewhere and SoFi is a good place to start. I remember this was one of the first interviews I ever saw when doing my uh, diligence on IPOE when uh, the SPAC merger was announced. Anthony Noto was on CNBC talking about it and he mentioned that our entire strategy right now around being historically a student loan business and then expanding out of that is so that we can go after the doctors and the nurses and all of these high-end prestigious universities out there so we can target those people Because we know that in five or in 10 years, those people are going to be making bank and they're going to be looking to have a mortgage. And and so building that trust with those people from their student loans all the way to the small, you know, invest products and the financial services products to then get them at the mortgages and such. That is the relationship that they want to build. They're playing the long game. Yes, I totally see it. But here, I'm going to ask you a question, all you guys. As soon as you go for a mortgage, like you're saying, okay, you have the invest product, you have the savings product, whatever. I'm not sure what other options they have, but you go for the mortgage then. And uh, they give you 4.2, and then Wells Fargo gives you four. Who are you going to go with? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. 
Wells Fargo. <laughs> this is the problem. There's no mode at the end of the day. How, how, how could we possibly look, lose to Wells Fargo? Well, I'm telling you, if they actually give you a better rate, then they it's possible they do. But by the way, yeah. there's hundreds of lending, there's len lenders galore. But then you, then you can make the same equal argument the other way around. Like if I'm yeah. a Wells Fargo customer and SoFi offers me a lower rate, then it's like, absolutely, it's a free for all. No, no, but this is what I'm saying. It's like Subway. If they give me a free sandwich, I'll take the free sandwich. Then I'm going to go back to the thing that I like to do. So if somebody else gives me a better rate at a different place, if that's all we have here is a better rate, sure. it's just not enough. So let's just say we're throwing customer loyalty, all that shit out the window. And out the window with banks. Fuck okay. them. We're thinking in a vacuum, just rates. Subway can give you a free sandwich today, but you know as hell that they're losing money on that sandwich. They can't do it tomorrow. They can't do it sustainably. And like this is, it's the same thing, you know, with regards to, to Tesla, right? They can price everybody out because they're vertically integrated and they have better margins to do so. And so if you think of well, a lot well, of- Well, actually, okay, that is, that is powerful. If you're saying that they're going to make everything cheaper because they have all of these things in a flywheel. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's as, as a result of their vertical integration and as a result of them not having the legacy burdens that the other players do. That's what Tanner was saying, like how the hell is Wells Fargo ever going to have a lower rate than SoFi? Because we all know that they're going to be losing money on that deal or it's going to be super risky. SoFi has a nationally chartered bank just as Wells Fargo and just as JP Morgan, mm -hmm. which means they have zero advantage on pricing or, or interbank rates or the rates with the Federal Reserve. We all have the same rate. There's zero pricing power versus them. Then we have to look at, okay, well, what's their operating costs? And whenever you compare them versus the cost that they have to spend on their branches, if you look at the cost of uh, acquisitions for Wells Fargo and Citigroup, they, they can get as high as $1,000. They're, they're mm. extremely high. So three they're times higher than SoFi, you're saying? Well, yeah, because because we're starting to get people through referral and there is, a, although be it small comparatively to Cash App, there is an organic level to people coming onto the platform. So Vitaly, have you heard about like the next generation banking core strategy that Anthony Noto is trying to do? So back in 2022, Anthony Noto was talking about how SoFi's backend infrastructure is built. Right now, Galileo offers a core technology and a ledger to its partners. However, it does not offer a multi-product core technology. What this means is SoFi is paying other companies to use their lending infrastructure. Noto's future goal is to have one multi-product core that serves all of our products and can be extended to include new products. So you're bringing so up my bull case with Galileo. Yes. So, but here's the problem is that Galileo doesn't offer this yet. We're selling it. If you look right here, this is advertisement from early January of Galileo advertising that, but we still don't have our own investment back in. A lot of the reasons why SoFi Vitaly isn't cool is because it takes forever for us to actually build out our front end because our back end is not this multi-product core that we're working on. It's kind of separated into these four silos, but our ultimate go goal is to have it like all into one big platform so that we can like build more products, faster, cheaper, with operational costs lower than anybody. I did read an article by McKinsey. Banks that actually run on next gen banking cores, the savings is like 90%. You're basically running on 10% of what you used to run on operational costs. So SoFi is not eating its own dog food right now? They're yeah, not so using their whole Galileo stack, the one, the one they keep selling to everybody else? They're not using it? We, we are. They we just are. acquired it. We have our own buy now, pay later service built by Galileo and Technicis. Uh, essentially... What Anthony Noto had said whenever they were acquiring Technosys is that this is infrastructure technology or, or regulation technology. And so they're helping other banks build their banks, right? They only have so much manpower. And so they want to rush as there's this gold rush to turn legacy banks onto the new cloud native technology. SoFi is a guaranteed client of Technosys. That's an absolute. But they don't want to waste time building that whenever there's a rush for clients that aren't guaranteed clients and there's a lot of competition. So go out and acquire the people that we're not guaranteed to get right now and then come back when you're done and fix up the old house. It goes against the Amazon model that I sort of believe Jeff Bezos did in the early days where he ate his own dog food. He created AWS for himself and built that's out an infrastructure. And everything that's, had that's to be- That's not true at well, hold all. On, hold on. Am Amazon.com very yeah, notoriously did I not use AWS for the longest time. <laughs> they were using Oracle. They were not eating their own dog food well, up until like 2017. <laughs> okay, you might, do, you might say about the database part, fine. The actual database part, that's Oracle. But in terms of all the APIs they built on top of it, they did use that. And that is what they said. We have to have everything to be an API that we can use and that everybody else can use. So my question to you now is, self-I doing that, where they can actually start it's, using their it's own API? It's a little API. better. 
for banks and fintech, all the innovation is is done by fintech and banks have been hiring them over like 15 years now because it doesn't make their product any better at all. But for what SoFi is doing is like they're building the infrastructure and- SoFi uses uh, Galileo's APIs to do all their payment processing, but no, they have not switched over their core and ledger processes over to Technosis, which is not the more important part. How long is it going to take? Curious. 2024, 25. No, it makes sense because these are financial products. You can't just switch overnight, first of all. That, that part I understand. But as long as there's some actual timeline and not just random, oh, maybe one year we do this, you know? This is where I was like, man, my only my only real uh, bull case here, it doesn't seem like it's working out because it, it's they, going over it's a, a little bit. Client. Yeah, it's their second biggest client that has all their accounts that moved off of the Galileo platform. It was platform. Uh, the FinTech company current. current. And where do they go? Visa uh, Direct. So, okay, so Visa has a competing product to Galileo. It could be that like... Like they're, they're going to Visa for a better offering or just to save money. There's no monopoly in finance. There's a thousand competitors in every single space. Small differences make big changes. There's about like six different large businesses that you can have in finance, like payments, financial infrastructure, lending, deposits. What I find very interesting about SoFi is there's not many that really touch into all of them. And aside from payments, because so, uh, SoFi is quite small in payments. Yes, we have Galileo, but even then we're not quite in that space. All of the other ones were in. There's very few competitors that play in every space. So yes, we have unlimited amount of competitors, but the fact that we're doing them all and doing them all quite competitively is a moat in itself. One one thing I, I will also say, and just for your awareness as well, Vitaly, because this is something that they dropped in, in one of the firesides and it might not be something that's very publicly talked about. Mm -hmm. With regards to that Galileo account dip, so two things. Number one, on the margins, because that was one of the bear cases that came up over the past two quarters. It was as a result of them moving from on-prem to cloud and they were just doing that migration and the costs associated with that. But for the actual accounts themselves, and to Tanner's point, like there's always going to be competitors Anthony Noto, I think a couple months ago in a fireside chat with uh, JP Morgan, highlighted his strategy with regards to Galileo. First of all, noting that they're already partnered and in talks with large legacy players who are just doing pilot programs with Galileo to move their infrastructure. And as a result of these pilot programs, what they're doing is every new account that they're getting is on Galileo, but they're not moving their bulk directory of all of their existing accounts until they prove out the model. The idea being that you see this step steady, gradual increase in Galileo right now. And it might fluctuate because there's some big accounts that make up huge numbers. Once a lot of these pilot programs with legacy players get validated, they're just going to funnel a huge number of their existing database of clients onto Galileo when they migrate all of their existing users that have been with that uh, bank for, for years and years. Because right now it's just trickling in because it's only their new user additions. You don't just rush in and change all your systems over to one. So you, you test it out. It could take a year or two to test out something. So current left. The question is, how easy is it to leave? Which I don't know. How easy is it to leave Galileo that they can just go to Visa and transfer this this large amount of accounts? They've been talking about this client leaving for like six months. So, so it was, it was six months of moat. Is this what you're telling me? So Galileo has six months of moat, basically. You, you understand, um, like when you lock somebody in, uh, iPhone has my photos. It would take me months, me personally, just to uh, weed through yeah. all everything that Apple has of mine that I have to go transfer to an Android device now, right? They have a moat. You can't just move somewhere. But if it, is it six months? Is it three months? Like that actually matters. Yeah, I don't, I don't so, think it's that long. Not every client needs the same features and, and no, aspects. Sure. So current could be very, they are not a complex business. Similar to Chime. Yeah, the problem is, is our largest client is also that type of business as well, which is Chime. So, so, so if Visa similar. comes along and says, hey, we'll just knock off 50% because I don't care about this business. It's, it's, it's nothing to them right now. They just want to steal customers at this point, right? Like Galileo can keep going on a downtrend because Visa doesn't care about uh, knocking down 50% and just undercutting Galileo. They just don't care about it. Yeah. And and so this is why we acquired te uh, Technosis. The, the complex businesses are the large legacy banks that have multi-product cores that need to all be in one. And that's why we acquired Technosis. And so the idea being the new clients that we're going after, which could be the Wells Fargo's, the city groups, would bring on so many new clients and not be able to be taken by Visa because they don't offer those large solutions, the complex options. So as soon as you're on Technosis and Galileo, when it's combined into one, you're saying that is the moat. That is why it's going to be hard to get off. Switching yeah, costs for, for goes complex up a lot. clients. Yeah. It's actually kind of drastic how big the switching cost goes because like you'll have your entire bank running on SoFi. This has been really yeah. good, by the way, Vitaly. Like, I love the fact that like you're poking holes, you're asking the right questions and like yeah. 
it, there, there's sharp questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vitaly. I appreciate it. All right, it was a pleasure. Bye. Why don't we end it there? Bye for now. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Hit subscribe.